Good morning. Uh, it's earlier than we usually meet for these events, so I'm glad that you could be here. Um, my name is Mary Eintema. I'm the president and CEO of World Boston, and I welcome you to today's program, Culinary Diplomacy South Korea. Um, I am so excited about today's session um, with our very own World Boston alumnus, Jae Woo Han, from his home um, in South Korea. So, uh, as you may know, World Boston is an independent, nonpartisan, nonprofit organization with the mission of fostering international engagement and global cooperation. Uh, that mission is particularly important during this truly global time of pandemic, even as we're practicing social distancing. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, we are inviting you to join us in a range of virtual activities designed to help keep us all internationally engaged. You can learn more about World Boston at worldboston.org. And also, um, I hope that you'll consider donating, uh, supporting us financially, which you can also do at worldboston.org. Uh, today's event, as you may know, is part of our new series called International Engagement in a Time of Isolation, which is designed as part of our citizen diplomacy work. And it focuses on people-to-people -people contact and the human face of the international dynamics shaping our lives. Uh, we have another um, session of international engagement in a time of isolation coming up next Tuesday, uh, and uh, next week we'll be focusing on Chile. Before we go on, uh, just a couple of quick housekeeping notes. Uh, today's session is being recorded. Uh, everyone but the speakers will be muted. Uh, please put your questions into the chat box. Um, and don't forget to turn off your phones um, when we do, um, if, if your mic does go on. Uh, so really that's it for me. Thanks again for being here. I'm very happy now to hand over our proceedings to my colleague, our program associate, Lily Terrasson Honeystead. Hi everyone. As Mary said, I have the pleasure of welcoming you to today's episode of Culinary Diplomacy South Korea. And we really appreciate you joining the Culinary Diplomacy event earlier than usual so that we can account for the time difference between South Korea and the U.S. East Coast. So I began working at World Boston as a program associate in January of this year, and I've been assisting both the citizen diplomacy and global engagement team. As we've transitioned to virtual events, um, I've had the pleasure of being able to assist in outreach for the every virtual event that you guys have seen, but this is my first time as host and sadly also my last event at World Boston. But most importantly, I want to welcome back our chef of the day, Jay Wu Han. For those of you who don't know Jay Wu, Jay Wu and I started as co-ops at Northeastern University as Northeastern University students at World Boston in January of this year. And for those who are unfamiliar with the co-op program, Northeastern Uni University places a great emphasis on cooperative education. World Boston is one of the many wonderful employers of the co-op program, and each semester, students are able to go through the job search process from interviews to applications and eventually job offers. With co-op opportunities that span across all fields of work and even all seven continents, every single student's experience with the co-op program is so unique. Jay Wu and I were lucky enough to start at World Boston at the same time. As program associate, Jay Wu was able to assist with social media and leading the outreach and organization for Academic World Quest. While at World Boston, Jay Wu made such a meaningful impact on the organization. For some more context, Jay Wu is an international student from South Korea, which he'll be discussing later during the demonstration. Unfortunately, due to COVID-19, Jay Wu returned home to South Korea. And while we certainly miss having him on the team, we're so excited to have the office comic back. As Jay Wu takes it away for the next 45 minutes, I want to remind those of you who have recently joined the call to make sure that your mics are muted, but to keep your videos on so that this remains an interactive and fun event. As you have questions about the Dalgona coffee recipe, about South Korean culture, or questions about Jay Wu's experience as an international student, we ask that you write it in the chat box and I'll read them out at an appropriate time. Additionally, my colleague Josh will be writing out the steps for the Dalgona coffee recipe, and this session will also be recorded. So don't worry, if you do miss any steps, we will be sending a follow-up email with the written recipe as well as the video itself. With all of that being said, we ask that you be mindful that there is a transcontinental connection here on Zoom. But besides that, it's over to you now, Jay Woo. All right, thank you so much, Lily. Um, <clears throat> if you really hear me. Uh, thank you so much to everybody who uh, will be able to join us today. I have such a pleasure to be able to uh, do something for World Boston again. Not only just my first real job, but such a great company to work for. And I, I had so much fun in the office and I'm still having fun now. 
So a um, little background for me. My name is Jay Wu Han. I, um, I was born in South Korea, but my family moved to Beijing, China when I was three months old. So I practically grew up in China until I had to move back to start high school back in Korea when I was 13. And so, yeah, my experience, I think, previously before Northeastern has been pretty international, but being an international student, um, I think Northeastern was a great school to like kind of not only just experience what American college life is like, but have such wonderful opportunities like the co-op program to work with World Boston. Um, so first things, first things first, um, I'm going to teach you how to make Taiwan a coffee, which is like this big social media trend that blew up things to TikTok, if you guys are familiar with that. Um, some person who was bored in their home, had nothing better to do, decided to get a bunch of instant coffee and make something uh, that tastes really good. So I'm gonna teach you how to do that. Um, oh, before I do that, uh, Tairwona is essentially this kind of, um, it's really just sugar mixed with baking soda and kind of slightly crisp up to make the sugar candy. It was really kind of popular in back in like the 60s, the 70s. And you can commonly see it found in like um, marketplaces or kind of like local fairs where you could just go and buy it for a really cheap price. They usually come stamped in these little cute um, images that you could try to, um, uh, I guess, eat without ruining. That was like a whole thing. I don't know, this is like back in my parents' generation. So I'm not very personally acquainted with it. But apparently this coffee, it, it, the color wise looks exactly like it, but it kind of tastes like Taiwan as well. So to first begin teaching you how to make it, I'm gonna just tilt my camera down a little bit. What you want is, if you saw the ingredients list, you just want, all you need is sugar and some, well, water. I think everybody has that. And some instant coffee. In this case here, we have Maxim Gold. Maxim House, I'm not, I think it's Maxim House Gold. And it was just the most popular American coffee brand in South Korea. So what you do is, it's very simple. You just wanna get about maybe a tablespoon of sugar, uh, about two tablespoons each of sugar and instant coffee. This should make either kind of like around two portions. But for me, cause I really like Taiwan coffee. I'm just gonna say it's one big portion. Don't tell my mother. Um, <laughs> and it's kind of late here, so I'm going to need a lot of coffee to power me through this uh, webinar. What time is it for you? It's 11 p.m. here, so oh, wow. definitely don't tell my mother that I'm up and drinking sugary drinks and talking to my friends over the internet. All right, so after you do that, you just want to get just enough water, maybe a ooh, tablespoon, just enough to kind of get the instant coffee to start dissolving. If you add too much coffee, if you add too much water, it's gonna come out kind of, it's about that much. It's gonna come out a little too syrupy. And what you wanna do now for the next 10 minutes of your life, just get a whisk or some kind of mixing device to kind of emulsify the sugar, water, and then the um, instant coffee together. And what this does eventually, if I'm able to use the magic of video editing here. You get something like this. Ta-da! Yeah, about maybe, well, that's a lot of whisking. About eight minutes of whisking, you get this kind of almost peanut butter-like consistency where you just kind of do that and you just whisk back and forth and it should kind of coat the back of your spoon and not really fall off. See, I cheated and I didn't use a whisk. I used a hand mixer, something like this, with a lot of power. But then if you do that, it's going to kind of splatter around the bowl. So I used a patent pending scrape and whisk technique where you scrape down the sides and you whisk in the middle. And after about eight minutes of doing that, you get this lovely kind of peanut butter like consistency. Well, please let me know if you need me to repeat any steps, but that's around it. It's very easy to make. Mm -hmm. um, the hardest part is just whisking for about like eight minutes straight. But definitely use a hand mixture to have it. If not, a whisk or a spoon will do. Now, after you have this mixture, you just want to grab your favorite cup and some milk. Any milk will do, just really any milk that you want in your latte. It's a mug from the Northeastern Student Government Association. And just fill it to the top. 
you'll need a lot of milk. This is very sweet, so you don't want too much of the mixture. I realized this last time after making too much. And if you did it right, you should be able to just lightly scoop and spoon the mixture above the milk. And it should just lightly kind of sit on top of the milk. Thanks to all the air you put in with the whiskey. Would you say that this is more of an at-home recipe or do you think that you've been seeing it pop up in cafes and things like that? Uh, this is definitely the quarantine version. Cafes kind of like to emulate the flavor. Mm -hmm. It's basically really just a caramel latte there. But if you really go through the process of doing it and make this nice, sticky, sweet, caffeinated, delicious beverage at home, it really, it really is a labor of love, but it's worth it. It's absolutely worth it. Mm -hmm. And just kind of mix it in there. Yeah, make sure your coffee to thing ratio is more skewed towards the milk, milk side because it's really sweet. It's just concentrated sugar and instant coffee. So mm -hmm. if you do that, you should just sit above the milk with a nice layer, kind of like a stroop waffle sitting on top of a cappuccino, if you will. And then get a few grams of coffee to make it look pretty gram worthy and just balance it on top. And there you have it. Wow. It's Taiwan coffee. I'm gonna go wash my hands real quick. We actually have a question in the chat um, that's wondering, have you seen any creative variations of the coffee or is it typically the recipe that you showed us? Um, hello, I'm back. Uh, this is like the OG original recipe, if you will, Colonel's original Taiwan coffee. Mm -hmm. But um, I've seen people do it with like different kinds of sugar, like brown sugar, cane sugar. I think it yields different flavors. Um, different brands of instant coffee. I'm just using Maxim Gold, for, for example. Some people have been using the super bougie instant coffee called Kanu, which mm -hmm. is like this bougie instant coffee brand in Korea. Apparently it produces a more, uh, I don't know, sophisticated flavor, if you will. Um, but yeah, this is the basic recipe. And the way you want to enjoy it is kind of mix it in, mix it all in, like a latte. Oh God, that still has some chunks in it. <laughs> but uh, I swear, I swear it tastes amazing. And you just want to, oh yeah, that's delicious. They <laughs> will. Um, and you mentioned baking soda earlier. That was for, yeah. what was that for specifically? That's for actually trying to make targona. Targona is kind of like this, like I said, um, a crispy kind of sugar caramel, if you will. Mm -hmm. And if you just kind of slowly caramelize sugar and add baking soda to it, it becomes this color and this consistency and it cools and it becomes like this little kind of tree. So that's what targona is. And this coffee is called targona coffee because it looks like it and kind of tastes like what targona originally tastes like. Oh, wow. And is there any particular snacks that you like enjoying with your Dalgona coffee or? Ooh, particular snacks. Ooh, that's a little decadent. This coffee's already like just so sweet and rich. Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't recommend having it with other stuff, really? but if you were to maybe something blander. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's an intense just caramel coffee, just flavor every time you take a sip. And it just makes your milk kind of Mm, it's really sweet. <laughs> yeah, it's a very unique flavor. I highly recommend you try it. Um, there's plenty of guides online. And I'm sure Lily's going to email all of you guys a version as well of the recipe. Mm -hmm. And yeah, but that's pretty much it for Taiwan coffee. <laughs> I mean, that was pretty easy. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty easy. I know you also have some snacks that you wanted to show us. Yes, I have three of my favorite South Korean snacks. Mm -hmm. And... If I'm, well, I'm just going to start with this one. This one is called Home Run And in English, can you guess what it is in English? It's Home Run Ball. So this snack was first um, made in Korea in, as you can see on the top left corner, I think it says 1981. So this was made in the 80s. And that was kind of at the peak of South Korea's um, uh, manufacturing booming 
but also like the popularity of Korean baseball becoming huge. I know you guys in the States, um, because you guys can't fill stadiums right now, have been watching a lot of Korean baseball. And if you could tell, baseball is really huge in Korea. It's been big for like, I want to say since the 60s. Yeah, since my grandfather's time. So baseball is huge. Obviously, you need a snack that follows suit, follows suit in, pos um, in popularity. So if I'm going to open this for you guys, because we have this nice plastic, well, not so nice for the environment, but plastic container. And Sure. The actual home run balls are just these these little pastries that are kind of filled with this shoe chocolate filling and oh wow oh man that tastes so good that that brings me back so this snack's been around for a while and they still keep the flavor the same I don't know how I think it's a closely guarded recipe. I, plenty of people have tried to replicate it from home, but I think it's pretty difficult to get this exact flavoring right. I'm pretty sure this was developed back in the 60s, 70s, so there's some stuff in here that <laughs> might not be the best for your health. But yeah, um, these were introduced to me by my grandpa, who first of all was a huge fan of baseball. I never really developed that kind of worship of the sport, but he, I remember as a kid, he's passed away now, but he used to have this um, 4M tattoo of a baseball bat and like a little baseball. And I'm like, wow, he must really like home run balls because he really did. He really liked baseball, baseball. And he had a tattoo when tattoos are in a conservative country like South Korea, very taboo and probably considered even more taboo back in his day. Um, so yeah, that was a, one of the older memories I have about uh, my grandpa and about like learning about what Korea was. Because you have to know from my perspective, um, I was learning about my home country while living in China. So a lot of like the cultural stuff I learned was through snacks. And that kind of leads me to a second snack that my dad introduced to me, which is teogang wow. or shrimp crackers. Man, oh man, these things are a classic. Um, these are pretty much just um, shrimp flavored crackers, I guess. But these are even older than the home run balls. These were made in 1971. Or was it no? Wait, yeah, 1971. So this is even older than the home run balls. This is probably like the first real South Korean snack you could, um, you could really, I guess, call a South Korean snack. But um, this thing prides itself on having four whole shrimp in each bag, which I doubt, but apparently they have it mixed in there. So, um, shrimp crackers. Um, my dad introduced me to it because he said it was his snack, favorite snack growing up, and I could see why the snack has been around for a long time. Because clearly it's very popular and delicious. If I open it up to show you... Mm -hmm. And while you're doing that, we actually have a question about Korean baseball. Um, oh, yes. So how good do you think it would be for Korean baseball, considering that it got to come back, come back post-COVID so quickly when the MLB hasn't yet? Ooh, um, well, I think that <laughs> largely might have to do with the immense amount of fandom that South Korean baseball draws, but it's probably more related to um, South Korea's COVID um, prevention policy that really allowed the country to quickly combat like the climax of the initial wave of COVID while being able to return to normal life fairly quickly. Um, I can get a little more specific into that, but bottom line, TLDR, South Korea's current response, really on point, really quick, really efficient. And I think that's what allowed things like normal life to go return to normal more quickly, such as like, you know, baseball. And I think that's why you guys are watching Korean baseball over there instead of, you know, watching the Red Sox play, which is a shame. I'm a Red Sox fan at heart, but yeah. <laughs> uh, so back to the shrimp crackers, uh, if yeah. you will. <laughs> they look like these little crisp here. They look like little shrimp, shrimpy shrimp. And they kind of just taste like, um, mm, they just taste savory and not really shrimpy, just a subtle hint of shrimp. But... These things are like, I remember my 
one of my earliest memories, like I said about the home run balls, of getting introduced to South Korean culture. My dad's like, he always would talk about how he and my uncle would sneak a bag of this from the pantry without my great grandma knowing because she would always stop them from eating too many snacks. And that was like one of the first things that I learned about when it came to Korean culture. Oh, and seafood's huge here, obviously. We put shrimp in everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, any more questions about these snacks? These historic, nostalgic snacks before we move on? Um, these are some I, of the best. A major question would be, were you ever mm -hmm. able to find these while you were in Boston, or are these exclusively found in South Korea? I actually, funny thing, Lily, for Northeastern students, I found these at Wollaston's while I was there. <laughs> Wollaston's like yeah. um, one of the local grocery stores that we have on Northeastern's campus. But mm -hmm. these are probably available in most um, Korean supermarkets or anywhere mm -hmm. around K-Town or Chinatown, I, I, I think. So yeah, try to get your hands on these. I think the exact translation for shrimp crackers is shrimp cracker, and these are home run balls. So it shouldn't be too hard to find. And the packaging is the same, as far as I found it. Yeah, so make sure you try these and let me know how you guys like it. Maybe the shrimp flavor is too intense for you, maybe not. Who knows? No, the home run balls <laughs> look really good. And the Dalgona coffee, I mean everything. Ooh, um, and yeah. I know someone, someone asked a question about the Dalgona coffee actually earlier. Um, about mm -hmm. have you seen I know you had mentioned that it's on TikTok have you seen a lot of people <laughs> outside of Korea making Dalgona coffee or has it mainly been I mean from your experience um from my experience it was just all my friends in Korea egging me on to try making it through their social media platforms and stuff to make yeah. it look pretty that's the whole point of like you know make it gram worthy right mm -hmm. um as for overseas I think this trend really started popping off um <laughs> getting popular after the whole COVID thing like really took hold and everybody was back home so I was back home as well by then back in Korea so I couldn't personally see it really you know catching on in Boston or in America but um I heard it's very popular and obviously okay. there's like recipes for it of like um non-Korean websites and blog sites so yeah I think it has gotten pretty popular <laughs> and maybe yeah. it'll get even more popular now you know that I'm I'm just, you know, doing this whole webinar thing, just saying. No, the video could blow up. Okay, <laughs> so a question about um, quarantine. How, is, mm. how are things in South Korea right now? I know specifically you're in Jeju Island. So yes. if you wanted to speak to your personal experience at Jeju Island versus the rest of Korea. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I actually live in Jeju Island. It's on the very south of South Korea. It's a special governing province. I'll get a little bit into that later. Um, but the situation in Korea has been really way, compared to America, relatively tame. Um, I know I was talking to you a little bit about this previously, but um, Korea's response to COVID has been very, very quick. And the government kind of learned from the previous SARS outbreak a couple of years ago, or is that, I don't know, eight years ago. And from there, um, they kind of learned that testing for the virus or whatever, pen, whatever things out breaking out quickly and to massive numbers is how they can quickly track down like patient zeros for each like pocket, if you will. And they kind of implemented that policy at the start of the whole coronavirus craze, being so close to China as well. Um, we we're one of the first countries hit severely. But if you look at some of the um, numbers posted by popular um, journalists, journalists <laughs> news uh, websites, you can see, um, South Korea's, uh, I guess, um, what's the word for it, um, infection rate, going down after hitting a peak early, way early on in this whole pandemic. And that's because South Korea has started to, basically, if they have someone who's been infected, if you're in South Korea, apparently you're subject to South Korean law. And the response policy that went, went, that went along with the law was, um, basically tracking where that person, individual who's been affected has been, who they have contacted, and using that information to find all the people they've contacted or the places they've been, and tracking down the root of the virus. And that was, uh, I think that sounds a little controversial to our Amer mostly, I think, American audience or Western audiences, because it's a 
pretty, it's pretty much just infringing on um, privacy rights as we know it in the States. But it was really efficient in being able to track down and prevent the spread of the virus. And it has been effective so far. As for where I'm living right now in Jeju Special Governing Province, they basically made it even more strict to who can come in um, to the, onto the island and in the initial stages of the outbreak. And now they're closely monitoring people who come from Seoul. And there was a case, uh, I think a couple of months back now, where there was one or two known cases of, in Jeju Island, but that quickly dissipated. And as of literally a few days ago, um, the governor of Jeju Special Governing Province announced that Jeju was corona free. And I think that's likely to do with obviously us being an island. We're kind of, I think, more insulated than the mainland of South Korea, but also because of the special governing province nature of the island and the governor being able to take more, I guess, or try to take more um, distinct action compared to what the mainland was doing. And it's kind of like a combination of all those factors that I think um, really prevented a large scale outbreak, uh, like a second wave large scale outbreak here in South Korea. Um, additionally, like economically, the South Korean government, mainland government has issued um, emergency funds to people. So basically uh, most families who are like, I guess like not top 1%, well, most families were issued around a thousand, less than a thousand bucks, just less than a thousand bucks of just the government's money to use to um, help support the families during this time. And that was controversial at first, but I think a, a lot of people have benefited from it, including my family. We received the aid as well. So, but another interesting aspect of that is the government tracks where you spend that money on. So for example, you have to spend that thousand dollars on like food products, medical products, et cetera, et cetera, houseware, things like that. You can't just spend it buying like, a, I don't know, a new tune up for your car or something. The government specifically tracks the allotted money and where it's being spent. So another avenue of how different cultures interpret our, like, I guess, privacy policy differently in South Korea compared to the States and how that has different effects. And I thought that was like a really interesting um, policy that's way different than what America would ever implement in my, yeah. what I, from what I know. Mm -hmm. And we actually have a question from the chat that asks more specifically, are schools back in session? And what about theaters and places mm -hmm. of worship? Yeah, um, most public places are pretty much just operational now, including schools. The Ministry of Education kept delaying it until uh, early May, but they eventually reopened up. So that's a thing. Um, as for other places of business or places of worship, um, I think they've been pretty much open in Jeju. Some businesses just decided to just shut down for a while because they don't have any customers anyways. But largely Jeju people are just out and about. Um, the situation of Seoul is a little different because they pretty, I think about a month ago recently had um, an infected person somewhere in one of the districts in Seoul. So they're a little kind of locked down there. But otherwise the rest of Korea is pretty opened up. We got past the worst of it. So a lot of um, places are being opened up for the public. Everybody's wearing masks still, but that's the only real precaution people are taking right now here. Mm -hmm. And I will admit, I looked up Jeju Island beforehand, and it is beautiful. So it's what would you awesome. say is the best part of living in Jeju Island, or what are your favorite parts of, of living there? Ooh, so Jeju Island was recognized by UNESCO as a World Heritage Site. So there's a lot of um, very Jeju-specific, unique kind of um, natural, cultural, environmental I um, icons here. But um, besides that, um, I would say the best part about living in Jeju is really just like the environment. It's beautiful. The, the mountain at the middle is just surrounding. It's just so much biodiversity and the ocean is right next to, you can just drive an hour from anywhere and you'll be at the beach. And honestly, it's the, just the tranquility of the entire island, I would say. And the atmosphere here is so clear. The air is just so nice to breathe. And um, yeah, really just the nature. It's just nice and peaceful here amidst all the chaos that's going on around the world right now. That's lovely. Okay, so back to food. What would you yes. say are the traditional meals of the day? And in terms of Dalgona coffee, when would you say is an ideal time to, to have it? 
Mm. <laughs> well, the traditional meals of the day are breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, Talagona coffee, uh, in my case right now, because it's 11.30 and it's close to my bedtime, but I'm here doing a webinar, so I might need to power up. So I recommend Talagona coffee as a late night booster. If you're you know, pulling all nighters from paper or you're working late, I recommend them. Or you can just have it in the morning, you know, as like a nice uh, pick me up when you wake up. Um, as for traditional Korean cuisine, um, yeah, people pretty much just eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, I, I don't really know what to say about it other than um, there's a lot of rice in our diet. Most Koreans would say they don't really feel like they're full or like they've had a satisfying meal if there's no rice involved. So you'll see a lot of rice mixed into like weird places. <laughs> and um, interesting thing that we do here is we usually have soup for breakfast. We have soup and rice for breakfast, which I think might sound a little strange for um, might sound a little different for um, other cultures, but that's a big thing. And like our biggest staple is rice. And I wish I could show you some, but it's 11 p.m. And I think my mom would get really mad at me if I used a rice cooker, the pressure cooker, which is really loud and will alert you every five minutes that your rice is being made. Mm -hmm. So that's the main reason I can't show any um, of like making more traditional stuff. But hey, late night snack time, right? You got plenty of delicious snacks to eat. So that's, uh, that's pretty much it for that, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then would you say that there are any cultural differences as to how you think Koreans and Americans view coffee or anything that you've noticed that's mm -hmm. been different in terms of the attitude towards food perhaps since you've been back in Korea? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a really uh, profound question that I may not have the answers to. That's such a gastronomically deep question about how food defines culture and cultural exchange through different cuisines might bring both um, clashes or similarities. But um, specifically for coffee, there's a big coffee culture here in Korea. Even in Jeju, there's a lot of like mini roasteries where they roast their own coffee. They make their own hand drip. It's like a big thing. And I think that all ties into with how Korea has largely I guess modernized or westernized over the years since the Korean War. So like things like coffee, things like um, uh, like Maxim Gold, right? Things like this wouldn't really be here if it wasn't for the rapid industrialization post-Korean War and the rapid modernization that happened. So pretty much like what you think of like coffee culture in Boston or the state, like going to Tate's for a latte, um, or like pavement for a bagel, that pretty much happens here in Korea as well. Like you might have like, you'll have similar things like you'll have, for example, a latte when you go to a nice little ca cafe somewhere, but you might have slightly different desserts. Like I guess you might have, I don't know, a cupcake at some kind of really cute cafe somewhere in the States, but here you might have uh, a really popular dessert place serves um, shaved ice with rice cakes on top so um, yeah there's slight differences slight cultural nuances but pretty much when it comes to coffee what we call coffee culture is yeah. very much present here in korea interesting and speaking mm -hmm. of being back in korea have you experienced any reverse culture shock since being back since you are an international student in the u.s mm. oh reverse culture shock. that's another really great question um, I would describe my whole life to be reverse culture shock because I identify as being South Korean, but, you know, I feel that every time, the longer I'm living here, the more I learn about my home culture, I seem to discover a part of my identity that I didn't really know about before. For example, things like, oof, uh, oh, shoes. Don't wear shoes in the house. That's what you do. You do not wear shoes in the house. You leave it at the doorstep and that was like a kind of weird um thing that i had to readjust to because in the state you know my dorm is kind of gross i just wear my dirty shoes in there i just kick them off and i lie on my um, dorm bed but here you know my mom would probably skin me alive if i do that if i track even just a little bit an, a particle of dirt in front of the doormat she will kill me so I think she's giving me dangerous looks right now. Um, but yeah, it's kind of like that. Things like I'm used to, you know, living in the States and coming here. Like, it's, 
those slight nuances and slight nuances I experienced immediately coming here, but like the bigger picture stuff, like how I talked about how my whole life is always like reverse culture shock. Uh, I experienced that to this day. Every time when I'm just having a conversation with my mom or um, some person that I just met recently in Korea, I have to kind of turn that side of my brain on and try to um, adjust again. That's really interesting. And <laughs> since you are, have been spending a lot of time in Boston, someone was wondering, what were your favorite places to enjoy while you were in Boston or your activities? For example, did you go to any Red Sox games at Fenway or anything like that? Uh, hot take, I don't know, lukewarm take for me, it was the MFA. It's right next to Northeastern on our campus. Northeastern students get free tickets, I think. Man, I just love the MFA. It's just such a great place. They have so many cool exhibits. They're always showing like cool films. Um, it's air conditioned. It's nice and like big and spacious. It was always a good place for me to go to to kind of try to clear my mind before a big um, big final or one of a, like a big competition or something. It was always a, just a, just a, always a great place to visit. So I would highly recommend if you're ever in Boston, go to MFA, visit Northeastern's campus and check it out. Yes, definitely. I agree with that. Um, and what would you say are some of the things that you miss the most about Korea while you were in Boston? Ooh. I probably, actually, I definitely miss um, the service culture. That's a very specific answer. Let me elaborate a little bit. Um, in the States, um, I think you have like a, weirdly to put it, um, just a more humane interaction with people who are like service providers. For example, you're like waiters when you go to a diner or, you know, someone who's like, um, I don't know, like your landlord or something. It's not, it's more, um, interaction a little more personable if you will and like there's a whole like tip culture as well right like that's kind of like part of the deal when you go to like eat out with your friends you always make sure to tip the waiter and like that over there is like totally normal it's fine i have no qualms with it but in korea sometimes um convenience comes with i don't know what a good word for this would be um oof, customer discretion let's just say Everybody here, when it comes to those kind of relationships, are fairly, if you go to like a random restaurant, for example, and your waiter's there, it's kind of like just business oriented, like, oh, hi, can we sit here? Thank you. We eat. Can we have the check, please? Okay, bye. Right? While in the States, it's like, hi, my name is what's so-and-so. I'm here to, you know, be your host tonight. And you kind of get to know a little about them and you have like, they're part of the dining experience. I think over in South Korea, the thing I missed about it is because like everything is just so much more convenient and it's quicker. And I know this sounds a little weird, but it's just easier. Sometimes you just can't really have a conversation with your waiter. With your waiter. You just want your um, late night slice of pizza, but the dude behind the counter just keeps trying to talk to you. And I'm like, you know, sometimes I just can't deal with that. And South Korea has none of that. The service culture here is like very if I were to describe it, automatous, kind of, kind of like a machine. And sometimes you miss that. Sometimes you need that. <laughs> but yeah, that's one of the very specific things I missed while I was overseas in the States. Interesting. And I know you mentioned that you grew up in China as well. Is there anything that you miss mm. about China? Uh, I really miss just um, Chinese food. First of all, like authentic Chinese food. Oh, man, I grew up on the stuff, so I really miss that. It's kind of hard to find unless you cook it yourself. But besides that, I really miss um, the Chinese like people and like the kind of atmosphere of living in China. Um, it's just a really different vibe than, you know, similarly, we're, it's in the same Asian country, you know, South Korea, China, but just the characteristics of living there is just so, so unique and distinct that I think I miss it because I don't really see that in ways. I don't see that vibe anymore here in Korea. And I was recently actually, I think about a year ago, been able to visit, visit Beijing again. And I kind of uh, had a lot of nostalgia for it. So it's really just um, the feeling of being there, whether it's the people, the culture, and the kind of atmosphere that's all around uh, China, especially Beijing. Very interesting. So going back to your experience as an international student, um, would you want to talk about maybe your experience with being an international student, specifically facing like the COVID pandemic, and kind of mm. events that took place leading you to be back in South Korea. And then I guess also touching on what would be your future plans now that you're back in Korea? Yeah, Very so, um, <laughs> yeah, serious questions there. <laughs> um, being an international student, 
obviously at Northeastern is great. There's a lot of um, support for international students there, although I think there could be some more, but um, yeah, it's really well done. Um, but as for the whole COVID thing, ooh, I think that was a tough time for everybody. And it just like, it's a tough time, equally tough time for everybody. But I think for international students, it seemed that it was disproportionately kind of affecting us because we gotta go home. <laughs> like the country is like, hey, you know, we're gonna lock down. If you wanna go home, you should go home now. And the same thing happened with our school's policy, right? I was like given very short notice to get out of the dorms, right? Cause I don't really have other housing. Like all my friends around me were like offering, you know, to let me stay at their places, which was great. But it's just the nature of my home being literally half a world away in a 14 hour flight made it kind of, um, made it a, a difficult gambit to face, if you will, to either stay and stay for a very long time or, you know, cut everything short early and leave. Um, so that was, I think, one of the bigger biggest things is just having to make that decision having that decision pushed onto us so quickly um was a little difficult as for me personally being a south korean national and uh <laughs> a dude i have to serve in my country's military a mandatory military service this is pretty much the remnants of the korean war as you might know korea the korean peninsula is separated by the ZM dmz after the korean war um, technically, it was made by an armistice, not a peace treaty. That means technically North and South Korea are still at war. So, and the DMZ is just simply um, like a temporary peace treaty, if you will, a ceasefire, really. So technically, I keep saying technically because it's such a weird issue, but technically war could break out at any moment. And so South Korea post-Korean um, War made a policy where all men who are fit to serve, when they come to age, they have to serve um, in the country's military. So it, you, back in my grandpa's time, it used to be like six years. Back in my dad's time, it used to be four years. And now during our time, it's around le a little less than two years. So I've been actually a big part of my decision to move back here early was because I have to start dealing with that. Um, it's very disruptive to you know, most international students' studies. Like I, for example, have to leave my um, sophomore year, you know, take two years of leave to do my service and then come back as a junior when I'm 24, right? It's kind of a different experience, but I wouldn't say it's any more difficult or disadvantageous for people in my situation because of the experience that I may have to gain through that time. But it's certainly different. It's certainly not, as you might call it, a traditional college experience. So that's pretty much what I've been planning. And that's the kind of stuff that I think I have to unique, uniquely think about and that not, none of my um, other friends can really kind of, I guess, help me through. So in that way, I hope that there is a little more support for students who are in my position in whatever college around Boston or even Northeastern itself. But um, yeah, that's one of the things that I've been uh, having to deal with as an international student. Mm -hmm. And in terms of the military service, um, I know you mentioned that it's two years requirement. Is there like a range of like, services that you can commit to in terms of like different branches of the military or is there a specific skill that you can hone in on or what is generally the structure of military service for South Koreans? Mm. So yeah, you can definitely serve in a lot of different ways for to, to fulfill your service. Um, for example, for a lot of kids who went to international schools at, in the high school, um, their prime kind of objective is to get into the branch that deals with the American military, like the Korean American, uh, Korean military and the American kind of like the cooperative branch. Apparently they say conditions are a little better. It's like kind of prestigious to get in and stuff. So all I know all my friends from high school tried to apply to that. A few got in, um, but also you can serve in the Navy, Air Force, all that jazz. But there's a lot of uh, unique ones, I think, that is different than other countries. For example, my friends, some of my friends have applied to the MP, to be an MP of mil military police. And they're kind of part of the um, division that govern, like, watches over the DMZ. So, yeah, I, I have friends who do that. Or in my case, um, <laughs> interestingly enough, when I was a senior in high school um, playing volleyball, I hurt my arm pretty bad, my sh shoulder pretty bad. So that actually got me exempted from doing 
boots on the ground service for a whole two years, but rather I'd be doing civil service, kind of like being that dude in the airport stamping passports. Like that would basically be my way of serving for two years. So there's a whole range. TLDR, they'll, they'll find a way for you to serve. <laughs> they'll, they'll find some job to serve your country, whatever for the cause, so. Oh, very interesting. Mm -hmm. And is there a specific, do you have any specifics in terms of what you hope to do while you're in the military or is it mm. more open to, is it assignment? Uh, Cause I know you said it's an application process. So yeah, you have to kind of apply for what kind of job you want in my case, but those jobs are being filled very slowly. So sometimes I have to wait until the next kind of um, next cycle in like three months or something to get it. Or my friends, some of my friends have just gone for like um, officer positions where they have to serve longer rather than two years. They serve for three and a half years, but the process is a lot more streamlined, a lot easier and um, comes with a lot more liberties than when you're, for example, just joining the army. So there's a lot of different decisions you have to make based on how much you want to really commit to this thing. If you want to like get something out of it, or you're just in the mindset of, I got to get this done. So you just join the army and you serve for 18 months and you're out. Mm. So it's kind of like everybody's um, kind of path is different in that regard. That makes sense. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah and of course. We have a question in the chat um, that's asking mm -hmm. about um, more so the political side. So um, in South Korea nowadays, would you say that there's a lot of interest in the upcoming U.S. elections? Mm, okay, so U.S. news from the new U.S. has always been, I guess, a big factor with South Korean politics as well because of the very tight relationship South Korea has with the U.S because it affects just so many issues. It affects um, Chinese-Korean relations. It affects North Korean, South Korean relations. It affects a lot of our um, economy, how we um, might have to rely on the US for certain things or where you know it might be. Well, basically, basically the US, a lot of what happens in the US affects South Korea. So if you're talking general populace, yes, I would say that they have like a, Mm, I don't want to use this word, but kind of not superficial, little slightly superficial interest in what goes on in the U.S. without really just getting into the nitty gritty of it. Kind of being interested in the outcome rather than the process that led to whatever U.S. policy was introduced. So in that regard, I wouldn't say interest in U.S. news is mm, very like present in the common um, general populace, but it's kind of sometimes it's sensationalized and that kind of becomes a driving factor for a lot of Korean news, especially when it comes to touchy subjects like um, America's response to like some North Korean news or whatever, something like that. Very interesting. And would you say that you particularly as an international student who's lived in the U.S., um, would you say that of other international students you know, is there interest in U.S. elections or would you say that you're more so in interested and invested in South Korean politics? I need to be more invested in South Korean politics because I'm now a voting age and I need to, I think I need to be an informed voter and mm -hmm. when it comes to, um, you know, voting for anything, whether it's just like some, whether it's for the presidency or like for um, a seat in parliament, uh, I definitely don't take as much interest being a political science major and international political science and international affairs major. I being having my education in the States, I think I garnered more interest in US affairs when it comes to politics. So um, I definitely need to know a little bit more about my own country's politics. But again, that kind of goes back to the saying of like um, reverse culture shock, where I know so much about a foreign country's politics, but when it comes to my own country, I'm like, ugh. <laughs> I'll vote for number six, I guess. So I definitely need to um, take more of an interest there. Mm -hmm. And so um, I know you mentioned that you had gone back to South Korea in March. So what have you been doing from March to now in Korea? Mm. Um, well, I've been uh, working, well, I guess <laughs> I've been working. Um, yeah, I've been just, um, I was a private tutor for a while. I've been doing that since I graduated high school. It's a great way to make some pocket change. Um, I've been driving. Jeju is a great place to practice driving because the roads are pretty safe and there's not a lot of cars here. So I've been doing that. 
I've been seeing my friends and I've been seeing my friends, which is crazy. I, like I'm it's sure for a lot of you guys, yeah. I was able to see a lot of my friends and um, my high school had like a Corona graduation where guests were not allowed. So like I got to, I had to stand outside the gates kind of uh, like meet with my friends afterwards when they were done with graduation and cause people weren't allowed inside the high school. Mm -hmm. So I've been doing just, I'm just, just hanging around. Just doing that. It's been fun. and making Taiwan coffee. That's literally all I've been doing. Mm -hmm. So it's been a great time. I, I've been keeping busy. Yeah, and you mentioned Corona graduation. So have your friends and family been affected by COVID whatsoever? Or would you say that generally, in terms of I know you mentioned now Jeju Island's Corona free, but mm -hmm. has allegedly uh, yeah allegedly I guess. <laughs> um, but in the past, would you say that? Um, friends and family have been affected by COVID-19 overall, whether it's like economically or however else, or would you say generally it's been, it's been rather quiet in Jeju? Uh, as for my immediate friends and family, really none at all. It's That's just, I haven't, yeah, really the, the people who haven't affected most by COVID in my immediate circle of people having my friends who are currently serving the military. Um, so basically while you're serving, you're allotted a couple of vacation days where you just come out and just, uh, come out to come out of the, um, uh, I don't know, the barracks and just hang out with civilians and in, in civilian clothes and stuff. Um, so my friends who came out on vacation got to hang out with me for a few days, but they had like a whole list of specific orders from their commanding officer telling them you're not allowed to go to um, this restaurant or this area, this district or this karaoke place because of um, coronavirus uh, concerns. Mm -hmm. So because they're you know, military personnel, they had to follow a much more stricter regimen than like civilians like I had to do. Um, so that was an interesting thing. So yeah, not thankfully, very thankfully, fortunately, um, no one really around me has been directly affected by COVID. Mm -hmm. That's incredible to hear. Wow. So um, another question that we have is, how has COVID affected the process of conscription and joining the armed forces? Also, how likely are you to get an occupation you chose when you do your service? Is it guaranteed? Mm, that's a great question because my situation right now is pretty much, I'm like, hey, I want to do this, this, and this job. I pick my top three and the Ministry of Defense tries its best to put me in there. But the problem with my whole thing, of people like me who are um, deemed, I guess, physically unfit to serve, not normally. So we have to basically wait for these civil service jobs. But the, the speed at which people you know, finish their service and the position becomes free is a lot more slower than like regular, the regular military. So for me, I'm, I just got my fingers crossed and hope that I get one of those places that I've put in my top three or I just keep getting delayed every three months just hearing back, you know, you, um, it's not open, you can open, wait and wait and wait and wait. And it becomes, you know, it might come close to a year before I can actually um, start my service. So that's a big concern for me. And that's the, one of the biggest things I've been trying to deal with here. One of the, yeah. Um, yeah, it's, uh, well, yeah, coronavirus has definitely messed up a lot of uh, things here as well in, in that regard. So that was actually our last question. Thank you so much. Jamie. All right. Oh yeah, no problem. Okay. Um, this was awesome. Uh, hope you guys uh, try some Korean snacks next time you get an opportunity. Make some Taiwan coffee and uh, visit Jeju when this whole pandemic's over. It is like I really recommend that everyone look up Jeju Island because the photos were spectacular. I can't even imagine. Mm -hmm. Yes, so I just want to say thank you, everyone. We've run out of time for questions, I admit, as I mentioned, so we want to respect everyone's time and conclude on time. Um, but we appreciate all the questions for Jay Wu and his culinary abilities and knowledge. Um, and once again, thank you very much to Jay Wu. Um, it was so wonderful being able to reunite with you virtually um, and for such an engaging demonstration and conversation. And thank you so much to all of you who tuned in. We really appreciate your call to citizen diplomacy during this challenging time, and we hope that you'll tune in for more future webinars. And as you may already know, we're running our virtual series, typically weekly on Tuesdays, um, and we will be pivoting to feature more local resources during these webinars. Um, and we will make those announcements about our programming for July and August. But before this pivot, we actually have one more event scheduled in this series. Next Tuesday, we will be featuring a chat with two women about wellness in the era of COVID-19. Paulina Salazar-Torres, who is a Wiley alumni and visited Boston in 2017, 
She'll be discussing her experience working in a collaborative um, science organization, as well as her work to find a cure for COVID-19. And her friend Lillian Denham Martini will also join her to chat about the female-led gender equity firm that she has, and both will describe the ways that they have been keeping up with their mental health during this time. The registration for that will be out soon on our website, and the actual event will be from 1 to 2 p.m. Please stay tuned for event announcements on our social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And if you're not already signed up for our newsletters, um, I highly recommend you go to our website and do so, um, which will, is very easy, as well as um, access to donations if, for those who are interested. Um, your friends at World Boston wish you all to remain in very good health and in good spirits. Take care.